beauty in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Truly a paradise on earth. And right in the middle of it is me, the influencer, Brian Zane. And as you can see, I'm taking a nice little early vacation ahead of my big weekend in Los Angeles. And that's going to be capped off by Mitzvah Mania. First ever Jewish WrestleMania. Not even Jeff Bucantz and the Mighty Maccabee could lay claim to that piece of history. See, Simon Miller, right now I know you're getting ready for our eight-man tag team match by lifting weights, pumping iron. I'm getting ready by relaxing myself, putting my mind and my body at ease as the ocean water laps around my feet. I'm getting in a great mental place. You know, I think that this battle of the YouTubers, Team Zane versus Team Miller, in all honesty, the hype, I think, is gonna be bigger than the match itself, because we all know there's one way that match is ending. It's with you on your back, me standing tall, my arm raised, my foot on your very broad chest. Man, oh man, a Shevitz, what the YouTube world is gonna say when the upset of the century happens, when the influencer takes down one of the nicest guys in wrestling YouTube, Simon Miller. I hope that your squad of Maccabee Warriors is ready, Simon, because mine is. And no one's more ready than me. Because I'm going to go into Los Angeles with a nice base tan, a clear mind, a full heart. And my mission is to beat you at Mitzvah Mania because I do it for the content. America! America! Well, this month here on the channel, we have taken a lovely journey through mid-90s WWF, crawling through the muck of WrestleManias 12 and 13, and coming out on the other side to the beginnings of the Attitude Era, where business is picking up and in many ways, never looking back. Let's all tape up our fists and develop an unhealthy obsession for beating up Pete Rose, because we're talking about WrestleMania 14, DX rated with a D, whatever that means, from March 29th, 1998, at the Fleet Center in Boston, Massachusetts. This show was nominated by Adam Vanderplum, Eric B., and Michael Chapman over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling with Regret. This is the final WrestleMania we're looking at this month. It's also the last WrestleMania that took place before I became a fan of this crazy business and really fell in love with professional wrestling. I became a fan of wrestling maybe two or three months after this WrestleMania. And what's wild to me is that comparing Mania 13 to 14, there is a huge amount of turnover between between those two rosters, but I think there's just about as big a turnover between WrestleMania 14 and when I began watching it around King of the Ring 98. What a huge turnaround from 97 to 98 too. Mania 13 only had 237,000 pay-per-view buys. This one did three times as good, 730,000. It drew just over a million dollars at the gate and it was their highest grossing event in North America since WrestleMania 8. This boost is thanks in large part to the incredible popularity of Stone Cold Steve Austin who won the Rumble match match in January, and of course we can't count out the impact that one of the most controversial sports stars of the era in Mike Tyson and his involvement in the show helping drive up those numbers. This is the first Mania to use the Scratch logo, which debuted in late 97, but there is still a lot of block logo imagery on this show, so the branding's a bit confusing. And of course this Mania continues their recent tradition of some of the most rinky-dink tiny sets imaginable. Come on, it's WrestleMania! Where's the grandiosity? It is a bit nicer than Mania 13 set, so I will give them that. Another continuing tradition on this show is that the opening hype package laments the lack of tradition happening in the World Wrestling Federation. Tradition has abandoned WrestleMania, taken hostage by a new generation of rogues. It's very much the realization of the message that was foretold at the hype package for last year's Mania. They talk more about the title made famous by Andre, Hulk, San Martino. Whoa, those last two names I did not expect to hear on this show. The narrative in this hype package is pretty cool because they talk about, oh, how tradition's being abandoned and how things are going going topsy-turvy and the world's going hell in a handbasket. But this great line near the end where they say that these men who shun tradition are destined to be part of it. Ah, WrestleMania, it is the most glorious thing. The weirdest part about this hype package, though, is the line at the end where it says, the father of WrestleMania will revel in this too. So, like, what, Vince? Like, watching in the shadows, seeing what's going on? What a weird, ominous ending to this hype package here. 19,000 folks packed the Fleet Center on this night. Jim Ross and 
and Jerry Lawler on commentary. The network version of this show omits any sweeping crowd shots. You don't get pyro. You don't get any of that grandiosity of WrestleMania. There's also a performance by the DX band they cut where they do their rendition of America the Beautiful, where they horribly butcher the song and it gets rightfully booed by the audience. But according to Chris Warren of the DX band himself, he says that Vincent Mann actually appreciated the fact that they did so badly and got booed because, hey, that's just more heat for Sean and Triple H when they get their live entrances. The show begins with a 15-team battle royal where the winners get a tag title shot at Unforgiven next month. The match features all these teams listed on your screen and the Legion of Doom, aka LOD 2000. Sonny is leading Hawk 2000 and Animal 2000 to the ring. JR saying, we thought they were done forever and they're back, but like they didn't really leave or at least not long enough for fans to notice or care. Like two weeks ago before this show, they had like a scuffle and they're, oh, we're done. We're, we're quitting. We're done. And then they come back here they have this brand new coat of paint like do we really think they were gonna be gone all the bodies flood the ring and everyone's punching this is the kind of shot they incorrectly use for Royal Rumble hype packages by the way people getting eliminated as does happen in battle royals Barry Windham of the NWA team just runs in and dumps chains out of the match despite not being in it also Kurgan shows up and pulls the Truth Commission guys out okay how many illegal eliminations are we gonna get here Mark Henry press slams Brian Christopher to a huge pop JR rightly calling out that Henry shouldn't even be in the ring anymore since Dilo was eliminated a while ago. Scott Taylor gets dumped out. Lawler be rating him for being a bad tag partner for Brian Christopher, though the history books will disagree. Down to the Godwins, the new Midnight, the new LOD, and the new Jacob and Eli Blue. Skull or 8-Ball gets eliminated, so 8-Ball or Skull leave soon after. Godwins are done, but they grab some slot buckets and dink the LOD with them. We're down to the LOD and Michael Barton and Bob. Animal comes back in and helping out Hawk. We get a pair of clotheslines to the outside, and the LOD wins in the match. I'm going to give this one star out of five. You know, there's a lot of bodies in this thing. It's a way for a lot of wrestlers to get mania paydays. It's chiefly designed to get the Legion of Doom over with this new coat of paint. So you can't argue that they failed in that mission because Hawk and Animal are super over here and then winning was responded to well by the fans. But this is just kind of a blah battle royal besides that. And hey, if you want to hear more about what the Legion of Doom did during their time in the WWF, you can check that video out right here. Boy, it's been WrestleMania madness across the media this week. We got a recap of the DX public workout at Faneuil Hall in downtown Boston, Austin appearing on Regis and Kathy Lee, Mark Merrow and Sable having dinner at a restaurant somewhere, and there's a charity event. All we go now to a match for the light heavyweight championship as the inaugural champ Taka Michinoku defends against Aguila. Nothing better than a title match at WrestleMania, which gets zero build and one of his competitors doesn't even get an entrance. Why even bother with this match at all? The action is fast and furious from the get-go. Aguila with a big moonsault to the outside. Taka takes a turn, does a big dive of his own. Lawler saying that Aguila should make like Taco Bell and run for the border. Boo! Taka is launched at the outside. He gets up fast though, goes up top at Aguila with a couple of big ol' arm drags. A big corkscrew dive by the challenger to follow up. Aguila with another moonsault in the kick out. Lawler makes a kamikaze pilot reference about Taka, so you can't say he is an equal opportunity. Very pretty leaping head scissors by Aguila off the top. Michinoku driver is countered. The moonsault is missed, but Taka still able to kick out. Taka intercepts Aguila in midair, hits his Michinoku driver to win and retain. I'm going to give this one and a half stars out of five. It is a blisteringly fast match. It's certainly unlike anything else you're going to see on this show. And really, the whole landscape of the WWF is very different than what the light heavyweight division was trying to be. It was their answer to WCW's cruiserweight division, but man, they did not put a lot of thought and care into building the light heavyweights. Uh, it's a lot of high-flying flash and dazzle, but not a lot of substance to it, unfortunately. Aguila, this would not be his last run in the Federation. He'd go through a lot of different gimmicks in this company, once as Papi Chulo and most famously as S.A. Rios. Well, WrestleMania is traditionally all about celebrities and get a load of one of the big gets they get this year, the former mistress of then Governor Bill Clinton, Jennifer Flowers. She interviews The Rock, the people's intercontinental champ. She asks The Rock, what would it be like if he was the leader of the country? And he says he'd rather be the ruler. Holy crap, they were planting the seeds for The Rock inevitable presidential campaign this far back? When it comes to the judicial system, he says he'd be a hung jury, Waka Waka. Says the interns should know their role and not do anything orally, I mean morally wrong. Get it? The president liked a good beige now and then. Why did they even use flowers for this segment and even for the show? It seems just like a, one of the most random celebrity usage 
in Mania history to get someone like Jennifer Flowers, who's known for really only one thing, and like how many wrestling fans are going to go, wow, I would want to pay to see her on screen at WrestleMania. Uh, although I will say, a fun fact about this interview, it actually is the beginning or it's the origin of one of The Rock's most popular and enduring catchphrases. Nine times out of ten, he'd be a hung jury. Have you smell what I'm cooking? European title match up next. Hunter Hearst Helmsley gets the live DX band treatment as he defends against Owen Hart. Two weeks ago on Raw, Triple H goaded an injured Owen into defending the title on the spot. China hit Owen in the leg with a bat and Triple H secured the title. Owen is no longer the black heart like we saw at the end of 1997. Now he's just the guy who gets embarrassed every week by DX. Boy, you gotta give it to Vincent Mann for trapping Owen in the company after the Montreal screw job, because how else would you get moments like this? Commissioner Slaughter has had it up to here with DX's antics though, especially China, so she will be handcuffed to him during this match. China with a lot of protesting, but she eventually gets cuffed, kind of pouts about it. Owen off to a fast start. JR also fast to point out that Owen beat his brother Brett at WrestleMania 10. Action goes to the outside for a minute. China is unable to interfere. Hunter does take over though. They give a shout out on commentary to referee Earl Hebner, who is actually in the hospital at this point because he suffered a non-fatal brain aneurysm just days before WrestleMania. You'll see a couple of different tributes to Earl throughout the show. Owen comes back for a moment, but is stopped with a DDT. He appears to have broken his nose at this point in the match. H finally begins to go after that wounded leg that was mentioned as a target all match up to this point. Owen throwing H into the corner. The boot goes up again, but Owen sees it coming. Gives Helmsley the ring post itis and a missile drop kick. The comeback is in full swing. Owen hitting the repeated pinfalls, but Helmsley keeps kicking out. Owen with a big top rope cross body as China is chomping at the bit to get in the ring. Owen's pushed back into the corner falling headfirst into Triple H's groin. Counters upon counters, Owen has a sharpshooter locked in, the crowd's going nuts. China helps with the rope break, then throws powder into Slaughter's eyes, and with Owen distracted, she low blows Owen, the pedigree, Triple H wins and retains, China gets uncuffed and celebrates by knocking Slaughter over. I give it three stars out of five. I thought it was a fine match. Owen and Triple H did a really good job, I think, especially give credit to Owen because he suffered that really big ankle sprain a couple of weeks ago, only removed his boot the day of WrestleMania. So for him to tough that out shows you what kind of performer he was and, and whatnot. I think it was just kind of an elongated wait period for that inevitable China interference because it is a fact, it is undisputed that every time a stipulation is introduced to prevent someone from cheating or interfering, you can bet your bottom dollar it's not gonna work and they're going to cheat anyway. On we go now to a very bizarre mixed tag team match, pardon the pun, as Marvelous Mark Marrow and Sable take on Goldust and Luna. The high package here detailing Sable's rise to superstardom as opposed to Mark Marrow's rise to mediocrity. Holy shit. The whole story here is that Marrow is tired of Sable stealing his spotlight and has waged a harassment campaign against his own valet, even incorporating the heel duo of Goldust and Luna. These two weirdos are a bit too weird for even Mark Marrow to tolerate, but both men portrayed as egotistical and insecure. Luna just hates Sable for existing. So you have kind of a weird heel versus heel feud going on here, but there's still a lot of babyface sympathy and dynamic for one member of the party in Sable because everyone else hates her, even the side that Sable is on. Mark Merrow does not like Sable. So uh, it's a very interesting situation for everyone to be in. I will say about Sable though, her character really gets to shine through in this feud. She drops some good promo zingers like, you get back here, you bitch, and <laughs> Marrow and Goldust wrestle for a second, but then it's time for the ladies to tag in. Sable gets a big pop. She chases Luna around the ring, but back to the dudes for a moment. Sable with a big kick on Goldust as well. The action's mostly staying focused on the men in this match. Marrow and Goldust collide in midair. These guys are bringing it in this match, but of course the crowd is begging for Sable. The ladies are tagged in again. Sable with a takedown is all over Luna and Goldust. Crowd is absolutely nuts for Sable in this match. Luna tagging Goldust back in. She hits him again. Good lord, what's her video game rating? TKO is countered into a DDT. The curtain call countered into a knee lift. We get a Marrow salt and a two count. Luna medals and it leads some friendly fire. Marrow with a TKO on Goldust. Luna breaking up the pin. Sable gets tagged in. She goes to pin Goldust. Have we forgotten the rules here? Luna goes up top splashing her own partner. Sable with a Sable bomb and a kick out. Luna takes over for a minute, but Sable comes out of nowhere with the TKO of her own and the win. 
I give it three and a half stars out of five, and it's honestly one of my favorite matches I'll show, and I will die on that hill. This was a very entertaining mixed tag team match. I mean, Marrow and Goldust easily carried more than their own weight in this thing, Luna as well, and even though Sable was the least experienced and trained individual out of all four people, they made her look good. She looked really strong in this thing, and I would say it was a relatively clean match, and I think the fans' reaction tells the story. Say what you will about Sable as like a person or a character, or whatever with the power of hindsight or where people back then thought of her. Um, the proof's in the pudding. Listen to the crowd reaction in this match. They don't get louder for many other people in this show except for Steve Austin. So I think it was a smart move by them to put Sable in that spot because I think it paid off in this moment. Though I do feel bad for Luna, honestly. The story goes she was threatened to be fired if she did anything so much as leave a scratch or some kind of injury to Sable if she was too rough with her. So, so Luna was really forced to play with kid gloves wrestling Sable. And so I think the story was the only person who congratulated her and complimented her on the match afterward was Owen Hart. Everyone else was just fawning over Sable for how she did and kind of leaving Luna in the dust. And that's a really sad story to hear. I think Luna, that's just one of many examples that I have seen in my years of being a fan and recapping things for this channel. I was like, boy, Luna really got the short end of the stick in her career, especially the WWE. Before our next match, we hear from Tennessee Lee, a.k.a. Colonel Robert Parker, who introduces a glittery Jeff Jarrett and Jennifer Flowers. Jarrett was part of the NWA Invasion storyline. He was part of Team NWA for a couple of months, but that whole thing flopped harder than Ric Flair and Nick Patrick combined, so he quit the group. He left Jim Cornette, and he's back doing his old country music gimmick that he did the first time he was in the Federation, but now with a new mouthpiece. Flowers is the guest ring announcer for our next match for the Intercontinental Championship as the the Rock defense against the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. Last time we saw Rocky Maya via on the channel, he was the blue chipper who was always smiling. Well, not long after that, he got injured, returned as a member of the Nation of Domination, and finally embraced all the die, Rocky die, and Rocky sucks chants. He's had a mammoth reign with the Intercontinental Championship up to this point. He is slowly beginning to usurp the power of leadership uh, from Farouk in the Nation, but he's not quite the leader just yet. And he's been feuding with Shamrock for, a for several weeks leading up to this. And most famously, there's a moment a week or two before WrestleMania where he just blasts Shamrock in the face of the steel chair. Apparently, it was Ken's idea. There is an added wrinkle in this match as well. If The Rock gets disqualified, he loses the championship. Ken's on The Rock from the get-go, sprints to the ring, and it's on the attack. They brawl on the outside. There's some big clotheslines. Rocky now bleeding from the mouth early on. Rock dumps Shamrock to the outside to gain the advantage. Goes back in and hits the people's elbow. This is back before it became one of the most electrifying, etc., etc. Shamrock sending Rocky flying. We get a big whoop. <laughs> Shamrock grabs a steel chair, shoves the referee away, which allows him to get another big chair shot right to the kisser. He does kick out, though. He starts coming back. He's in the zone. He's got the ankle lock in. Rock tapping out immediately, and Shamrock wins the match. But he fights off the other members of the nation after the bell. Keeps going back to the ankle of The Rock. Farouk comes in and wants to make a save, but then thinks better of it and leaves his partner high and dry. The crowd loves that. The ankle lock is still applied. In come a bunch of referees and officials, most of whom we've never seen before, which is an angle alert. Shamrock snaps and suplexes all the new guys. Rock's put on a stretcher. The referee reverses the decision and awards the match to The Rock. Shamrock runs up the ramp out of anger, knocking The Rock off the stretcher and onto the DX band stage. Shamrock holding the title up in defiance, but he wouldn't officially be ice champ until much later in the year. I'm going to give this one two stars out of five. There's not a whole lot to this match, which already kind of feels rushed. And then, of course, the bigger story is what comes after the bell. I mean, The Rock and Shamrock were, I think, one of the stronger mid-card feuds during this time. It was still kind of going on when I started watching, just a little bit after this. And, you know, before and after WrestleMania, they were feuding, which them becoming teammates by the end of the year in the corporation made things really confusing for me. We get the first instance of what becomes a very classic and enduring video pattern package about the WWF. It was kind of a don't try this at home message, but also talking about how like, yeah, you know, these guys, there's this perception that they're not real athletes and this and that, what they do is fake, but talking about all their accomplishments, their legitimate athletic backgrounds and the injuries they sustain in wrestling and how you think wrestling's not real, try lacing up my boots. What a great package this is. Then it's time for the dumpster match for the tag team titles as Road Dogg and Billy Gunn, the New Age Outlaws, defend against Chainsaw Charlie and Cactus Jack. The New Age Outlaws formed late last year and have had a very successful run by pretty much copying what Triple H and Shawn Michaels have been doing with DX. I mean, when you watch the Outlaws at this point, they're doing the exact
exact same gimmick like to the letter. It's a couple of smart aleck guys who insult everyone. They have this swagger and attitude about them. They're very anti-authority. It's pretty much the same damn thing as what DX is doing here. How were both duos allowed to exist on the same show? I mean, I guess it's no surprise that the Outlaws would become kind of like satellite members of DX around this time and then officially join the group like after WrestleMania. Like, you had to let them assimilate because otherwise you just had this redundancy issue. Chainsaw Charlie, aka Terry Funk, making his debut as this character in December of 97 by popping out of a big old box and well, you know what they say about people in wrestling who emerge from boxes. I have a chainsaw now. Rin, rin, rin. They also refer to him as Terry Funk along with Chainsaw Charlie, which to me feels like, oh, it's the same kind of thing as like when they acknowledged, you know, Mankind had these different personas. Like they knew Cactus Jack was formerly Mankind and also Dude Love. So I guess Chainsaw Charlie being here was kind of like Funk's version of that is my interpretation of it. But also it feels just kind of like, we all know he's Terry Funk and there's no hiding that. It'd be like if Adam Rose debuted in NXT and they kept calling him Leo Kruger. Two months ago, Jack and Charlie, who are a tag team, they fought each other in a match, they went into a dumpster, and the outlaws closed the lid and shoved the dumpster off the stage in one of the more shocking stunts we had seen at that time. It was given some real seriousness here. Now we have this title match where the winning team has to stuff both their opponents into a dumpster. Early in the match, Jack wants to do a rolling senton onto Road Dog, but Billy Gunn wisely pushing his own partner out of the way, so Jack just hits the side of the dumpster instead. Outlaws slam the dumpster door onto the heads of their opponents. They're about to win, but Cactus Jack fights back and is double fisting some mandible claws. The action finally moves into the ring. Weapons are utilized. Jack brings in a ladder. Jack climbs up for reasons. Billy Gunn pursues him. Funk is knocked into the ladder, and they both get dumped into the dumpster. Double team powerbomb to Funk in that container. They get back out and now the brawls made its way to the backstage area. Cactus is thrown right into the giant novelty bottles of Powerade and Surge. Hey, save the green stuff for WCW, gang. Billy and Rhodey placed onto a pallet. Funk forklifts them up and dumps them into another dumpster backstage. The lid is closed. Cactus and Charlie are declared the winners and the new champions, but that wouldn't stay true for long because we found out the next night that apparently they weren't dumped in the official dumpster match dumpster at ringside. You didn't count by putting them into a different dumpster, so they had a rematch the next night in a steel cage where the outlaws would regain the titles. I gave it three stars out of five. I thought it was a relatively short brawl, but there were enough hardcore elements and moments in there to keep things entertaining for me. I appreciated the ending. I thought it was very creative. And I think that the outlaws did a good job being the heel foils to these psychopaths they were fighting. Even though the outlaws were going to be super over as uh, baby faces and really popular and entertaining in that regard, before that, that switch hits though, they're still, I think, very entertaining as heels. And again, I think their shtick is better than what Sean and Triple H are doing, and they're basically copying the DX shtick. So like I said, I think they did a great job with their characters here, playing up against Jack and Charlie. Up next, the first official encounter between these two hellacious brothers from the dark side as The Undertaker battles Kane. Last year, Paul Bear revealed that Kane was alive. Finally in October, he done showed up. In January at the Royal Rumble, Kane burns Taker in that big casket, and after several weeks, Taker popped out of a different casket, while walking through the fires of hell to face his brother. And after months of promising he wouldn't face Kane, Taker finally had a heart-to-heart -heart with his dead parent in a graveyard and said it was something he had to do. We also get that moment where Kane famously shows off his lightning powers on the Go Home Raw, sets a tech guy on fire for a good old time. And you know, I make fun and I've talked about some of the overly dramatic and hokey parts about this angle, but I mean, I can't deny that this storyline really friggin' rocked. It was easily one of the better angles, storylines they had going at this time period the company, one of the best cases of long-term booking and storytelling that they had ever done, in my opinion. And, you know, like I said, I didn't start watching wrestling until after this WrestleMania, but I did get an Undertaker VHS that recapped all this stuff, so I was, like, fully invested. I totally, like, get the lore of Kane, and of me being a big Kane mark uh, around this time, it was just really great to watch and see this kind of origin of this character being this monster badass. But before the match, out comes our guest ring announcer, Pete Rose former Cincinnati Red player and manager, long disgraced for betting on his own games, here for the festivities. He begins by immediately denigrating Boston and their inability to win a World Series. He makes a Bucky Dent reference, a Bill Buckner reference. How about it? Jim Ross has to chime in and say, he's talking about the Boston Red Sox, folks. Kane walks into the ring, hits Pete with a goozle, then up and down for a tombstone, which Boston loves Kane for. It's the start of what becomes a brief and popular WrestleMania tradition. Nice job by the EMTs in loading Rose onto that stretch 
character. I'm pretty sure one of them was in the Shamrock segment earlier in a different outfit. We get O Fortuna, we get the Druids, there is no uniformity in how to hold their torches, at least one of them's chewing gum, then the lightning strikes and Taker comes out for his entrance, which is admittedly pretty damn epic. The crowd going nuts for all of this before the bell even rings, and rightfully so, the spectacle is truly awe-inspiring. The two brothers start by trading strikes, both men are resilient to the other's attacks at first, Kane begins to overpower Taker, drapes him over the top rope, big attack, why are these mats on the outside so filthy, what happened here? Taker somehow leaps up onto Kane's shoulders, but Kane drops him face first. On the outside, Paul Bear distracts the ref so Kane can smash some steel steps into his opponent, even Bear gets a couple of shots in, Kane with a big old choke slam, but he lifts his brother up out of the pin. Chinlock for a while, then time for the bop bop bops, he fights out of the headlock, sends Kane to the outside, goes for a big dive, but Kane just sends him into the announce table. Gotta love Carlos Cabrera and Hugo Savinovich's very delayed bumps off of that. Top rope lariat by Kane. Taker fights back, goes for a tombstone, but Kane hits one of his own, but Taker does kick out. He hits his own choke slam in a tombstone, which somehow looks even worse than the last one. Kane then kicks out, which is a huge shock, because no one's done that before to The Undertaker. He stuffs Kane with another tombstone, another kick out. Taker with a top rope clothesline, a third tombstone for good measure. Taker keeps him down just long enough for the three. Kane kicks out at three and a half, but Taker still wins. But Kane gets the last word with a tombstone on the steel chair, and they take their leave. Jim Ross says this war is far, far from over, and boy, would he be right in that assessment. I give it two and a half stars out of five. This was, at its core, a sloppy hoss fight. There were a lot of scary falls in this thing, but man, like, I love the intensity. I love the story, helping make up for some of that stuff. I love the insanity of what these guys did. Seeing that many tombstones getting kicked out of was simply unheard of at that time. And only for an angle such as this, where it's brother versus brother, these two titans who have these dark powers and everything, able to withstand some of the biggest attacks ever seen in a ring. I think you couldn't have anyone else pull this off. It was unheard of, but it made so much sense with these guys. Definitely wild to see here. And for their first encounter, after all the months and months of buildup, I think it did what it was supposed to do. We get another video package here, and it's all about the good old days. You have these legends like Fred Blassie and Pat Patterson, Gorilla Monsoon, Ernie Ladd, Killer Kowalski, all sitting there in this empty high school gymnasium in this old worn down ring, talking about what they used to do back in the day and how heroic and strong the stars of today are, how it says they used to cheer for me, now I cheer for them. It's a very cool emotional video package here that really does a good job in uh, paying tribute to the legends. And now it's time for the main event for the WWF Championship as Shawn Michaels defends against Steve Austin and Mike Tyson. Oh, wait, sorry, that is actually an intentionally misleading graphic that they ran for weeks leading up to this, knowing full well that Tyson wasn't going to actually wrestle in this thing, but no, he is just the special guest enforcer. It all began back in January when Stone Cold Steve Austin went against all odds to win the 98 Rumble match. Shawn Michaels beat The Undertaker in the casket match that same show, but infamously injured his back by clipping the edge of the casket at one point. He is in a very limited capacity for the next couple of months as they await WrestleMania. The night after the Rumble, Iron Mike Tyson was a special guest of Vincent Mann. He gets into it with Stone Cold Steve Austin, that famous encounter on Raw. You ruined it! By February, Tyson was announced as the guest enforcer for the title match, but then was revealed to be a member of DX with Triple H and Shawn Michaels, and now the deck has been stacked firmly against the Rattlesnake. Iron Mike shows up first, really showing his lack of respect for Steve Austin here, almost projecting a little too much. Shawn seen backstage dedicating his match to Earl Hebner. That was nice of him. The match is finally on. HBK begins by by running away, but Austin catches up to him. Michaels is pants and spends a good 20 seconds with his ass showing while he gets beat up. Hunter Hearst Helmsley jumps Austin on the outside. He and China are ejected for their efforts. Austin beats up Helmsley some more by the stage, then gets attacked by Sean. The brawling continues. Is this Symbolic King? Sean is hurled into the corner. Looks like a rough collision. You can see Sean wincing a lot from here on out, no doubt feeling the effect of his injured back. Sean avoids a stunner, but gets knocked off the apron and right on the announce desk. They fight in the timekeeper's area. Austin launched over the barricade onto the concrete. HBK dinks Austin with the ring bell, shades of WrestleMania 13. We get a big Holyfield chant directed at Mike Tyson as Sean continues his assault on the challenger, wraps Austin's leg around the ring post. Tyson helps Austin back in the ring. Man, this show truly is X-rated. Look at all these bums. Sean's got Steve in the figure four, but Austin counters it. Michaels with the sleeper. Referee is smooshed not once, but thrice. Austin gets the stomping, though. Sean comes back with the forearm, the kip-up, the elbow drop. 
He goes for sweet chin music, some spinning around. Austin hits the stunner. Mike Tyson comes in and does a fast three count. Austin wins the championship to cap off this eight year journey to the top. Austin gives Tyson an Austin 316 shirt and he holds it up. Sean wakes up and is in disbelief, takes a swing at Tyson, but he pays for it. Sean taking his final WWF bump for the next four years and is draped with an Austin shirt as we celebrate the beginning of the Austin era and the show fades to black. I give it three and a half stars out of five. This match was not like an all time classic Mania main event. And uh, I would say it's probably not Sean's best WrestleMania match. You could argue it's one of his guttiest performances at Mania considering what he was going through physically at this time. So for him to still put on a very good, relatively seamless performance, you really wouldn't know he was wrestling with an injured back if you didn't know the story. And so for him to put on that performance, I think was very gutsy, very well done. Austin doing uh, very well uh, as well in this matchup and Tyson's in involvement. It was minimal, but it still helped get everyone more over and just helped tell that story, that tension of what Tyson was going to do. And him helping count the pinfall at the end was a really nice touch. And so once again, the, the historical implications of this match are vast and they are deep. Uh, as far as the match itself, though, looking at it from a bubble, it's like, well, it's an okay match, but still phenomenal outcome. And the fans definitely got what they wanted. But then what are the fallout for D-Generation X? The following night on Raw, Triple H assumes leadership after Sean's injury. He brings in the New Age Outlaws and a returning X-Pac into the fold. It won't be long before DX goes from a heel faction to being a massively popular babyface group as Austin continues his time firmly on top for 98. My grade for WWF WrestleMania 14 is a C plus. Like I said a minute ago, there's a lot of historical importance to this show, to the main event, to The Undertaker versus Kane. But if you just look at the show in terms of like match quality, it's kind of meh. Like, you know, there's not, there's no one match that I think truly rises above everything else, kind of like last year when it was Hard in Austin and then there was the rest of the show. Everything just kind of felt very level, I would say, in this one. There's some okay matches, there's some not okay matches. Probably the weirdest selection of celebrities for WrestleMania I've ever seen. Mike Tyson, Pete Rose, Jennifer Flowers, what's that all about? And it's worth bringing up again here. It's another example of how the Federation, even though they were red hot at the time and they were doing buco big business and TV ratings were great and merch sales and they had all these great stars, they still didn't really know how to make a good WrestleMania for a while. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this look back at WrestleManias 12 through 14 over the last several weeks. Hope you got to see a real interesting uh, journey and the rise and the evolution of the Federation around this time. Uh, next month in April after Mania 39, there's going to be a bit of a content break, uh, but there still will be classic reviews a couple of times during the month. And I was looking at my list of nominated shows and I realized that there are five spring stampedes in existence and I've only reviewed three of them. So what I'm going to do for the month of April is finish that list I'm going to review those last spring stampedes beginning with 1998. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.